We welcome you to another Saturday night charismatic service here at Valley Christian Assembly. And I'm so glad you joined us. And I trust that as we worship, that right where you're at, you will enter into worship. The songs, uh, words will be at the bottom of the screen so you can sing right along wherever you're at. And I believe that as we worship the Lord, God's presence is going to come and do powerful things in our lives. One of the last songs we'll sing before I preach is called Breakthrough. And I pray that the words of that song will be a reality in your experience as you watch this. And as you not only watch it, but as you participate together with us, that God would bring breakthroughs into your life. Well, let's pray together. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus that we have the victory because you have overcome. And that there will be breakthroughs in our lives tonight. As we worship you, as we hear your word, I know there will be breakthroughs for those that are listening in many different places as they participate in worship and praise and receiving your truth. You will bring breakthroughs into our lives for you have overcome and we rejoice in that in Jesus name. Amen. I'm 
Jesus, we thank you tonight that, that your power, your presence, you are the King of heaven. And there will be breakthroughs. King Jesus, forever at our side. You break strongholds, O oh Lord. And, and when you speak, mountains are moved. And there will be breakthroughs. So I pray even as we bring forth your word, there would be these breakthroughs in our lives. And we thank you for this again. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, tonight we're going to turn in the Word of God to Revelation chapter 7. And we're doing a series called The Last Days. You know, before we were married, my wife attended a really dynamic church. And she was well fed the Word of God and well cared for. And this church at that time taught that there would be a secret su sudden coming of the Lord and we would be caught away before what was called the Great Tribulation. Many Christians believe there will be a seven-year period on the earth right at the last of the age, uh, and it's called, it's such a horrible time, it will be called the Great Tribulation. Now, one view of theology, eschatology, study of the end times, is a pre-trib rapture, or that Jesus will catch away his church right before this Terrible seven-year period begins. That's called the pre-trib rapture. And my wife Lorraine always believed in a pre-trib rapture that Christians would not go through tribulation. And then she married me. And after seven years of marriage to me, she now believes that Christians go through tribulation. I'm only kidding, of course, but there are a lot of different views on what is this all about? The great tribulation. And is there such a thing as a literal seven years that will close out human history with all kinds of horrible things happening on the earth? What is the Great Tribulation? And another question we're going to try to answer tonight is, are we really living in the last days? Are we living in the end of time? And what are these days called the last days? Well, we're going to jump into all this from the scripture, but listen to Revelation chapter 5, and I'm going to, chapter 7 rather, and I'm going to start reading with verse 9. John has an incredible vision of a multitude of people who are victorious, and they're worshiping, and they, they're coming out of a time of great struggle. Let's read about these people in Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. All the angels stood around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures and fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders answered, saying to me, Who are these arrayed in white robes and where did they come from? And I said to him, Sir, you know. So he said to me, These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in His temple. And He who sits on the throne will dwell among them. And they shall neither hunger any more nor thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them nor any heat. For the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Well, as I read this, something within me says, Lord, I want to be one of those who have the white robes and the palm branches and hearts filled with praise. And these are people who have been through a struggle, but they've been victorious. They've, they've participated in the victory of the Lamb. Tonight's teaching is entitled, The Great Tribulation and the Greater Triumph. And we want to look at these two things, the Great Tribulation. But I don't want to leave you there. The book of Revelation is not just about tribulation. It's not just about bowls of wrath being poured out and, and all kinds of judgments coming on the earth. Yes, those things are contained in the book of Revelation. But the main theme of the book of Revelation, the main point of the book of Revelation is the triumph of the Lamb. And so tonight we're going to be looking at the great tribulation and the greater triumph. 
Well, what do we mean by tribulation? And is there really such a thing as a great tribulation in the sense of a literal seven-year period right at the end of human history that'll be just indescribably horrendous? Is that really what the Bible teaches? Well, in the 1850s, a theology grew up primarily due to the teachings of a man by the name of Darby. And this theology became known as dispensationalism. And it viewed the book of Revelation not necessarily just as apocalyptic literature, but as futuristic and as literal. And that's been a way of interpreting the book ever since. And they, from that theology emerged this thought that there would be one tribulation period, a seven-year period, at the end of the humankind, at the end of the age, and we would call this the Great Tribulation. Now, I take a different view. I believe the book of Revelation, because it is apocalyptic literature, is what we've called fluid. In other words, it's not just for the last generation. It's not just for those people who were, are going to be alive right before the coming of Jesus. Nor was it just for John's revelation. It's, it's apocalyptic literature and there's a fluidity to it. In other words, the truths contained in the book of Revelation, it's truth in picture form, visions and incredible sights that just boggle the mind. And it's meant to have an emotional impact on whoever reads it or hears it read to them. But the major theme, as I stated, is the victory of the Lamb. And we know who the Lamb is. The Lamb is the Lord Jesus Christ. But this book was written so that Christians of every time period would find strength in their struggle, would find the power to overcome. No matter what was going on, no matter how many governments rose up against the church and thus against them, they would find a strength and a power through these words of John that we now call the book of Revelation. What do I mean by fluid? I mean that as we read the book, we can find many things that are fulfilled, and yet they might be fulfilled again. They, they can find their fulfillment in historical events, maybe even in our time, and yet should the Lord tarry, they can be fulfilled yet again in another generation, even as they have been fulfilled in past generations. The only event, of course, would be the literal coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. That won't happen over and over again. But the theme of the book of Revelation is this struggle between good and evil and the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ Christ conquers. Now this whole idea of a great tribulation. Do you realize that in the Bible there have already been, in biblical history, there have been times that have been equated with the great tribulation. For example, Jeremiah chapter 30 is quoted as a part of the great tribulation, verses 6 and 7, and that was actually fulfilled in the events surrounding the Babylonian destruction of the temple and the captivity of the Jewish people. And they called it the time of great trouble, of Jacob's trouble, as was prophesied by Jeremiah in chapter 30. And then later on, many years later, Daniel comes along and he prophesies some events that have been equated with the great tribulation. He talked about the desolation, the abomination of desolation, where the temple would be desecrated and it would be left in such a state it would be desolate. And you know this happened? Under Antiochus Epiphanes in B.C. 165, he came and, and he conquered Jerusalem. And then he desecrated the temple by taking swine, pigs, and sacrificing them on the altar as a blaspheme against God and as the ultimate slap in the face to the Jewish people. Daniel's prophecy, we could say, was fulfilled by Antiochus Epiphanes. And yet Jesus... Many, many more years later, in Matthew 24, he referred to the prophecies of Daniel and the abomination that will leave desolate. In other words, he was, he was fully aware that it happened, in, and Daniel's prophecy happened under Antiochus Epiphanes. But Jesus was saying it would happen again. That there would be yet another abomination of desolation. See, that's what I mean by fluid. It, it, we find fulfillment in various epochs of time, in different generations, and yet the marvelous supernatural aspect of this book of Revelation is we find it is true and applicable to every generation of the church, in all ages and in all places in the world. You know, when 
Adolf Hitler and Nazism was trying to wipe out the Jewish people and many Christians were also killed during that time. Those people thought that was tribulation. When the communists were trying to purge China of the church of Jesus Christ and, and she was driven underground, those Christians would have thought that was the tribulation. When evil Idi Amin was trying to purge Christians out of Uganda, those people thought they were in a tribulation. But all of those events could find a source of strength. People experiencing those events and living in those times, they could find a source of strength in the words of John, of the Lamb that overcomes. Yes, there's great tribulation, but there's greater triumph. And so we want to look at this. What does it mean by tribulation? What is this all about? I don't think it's right to just regulate the, the tribulation to a seven-year box that will only happen once at the end of the age. It won't ever happen to anybody else. If that's true, we won't be ready for any tribulation that we go through, nor will we profit from those struggles and hard times that we might have that God will allow us to go through from time to time. Another question that's being asked is simply, are we living in the last days? I mean, everybody's aware of this pandemic. Something has happened around the whole world, and, and it's a global event. Is this a part of the end times, we're asking? Are we living in the last days? The Bible has the answer for that, and the answer is simply yes. As a matter of fact, we're not living in the last days because of a pandemic or because of what one world power did with another world power. No, from the day of Pentecost on, we have been in the last days. In Acts chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, at the great outpouring of the Holy Spirit, Peter stood up and he said, These men aren't drunk like you're saying, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, that in the last days I will pour out of my Spirit on all flesh. Peter, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, was drawing upon a prophecy, an ancient prophecy of Joel, saying that the last days had, at least at that point, already begun. Why? He said, this is that which was spoken of in the last days. Well, the world hasn't ended, so if the last days began, at least on the day of Pentecost, when the Spirit was poured out, according to the anointing and the, the revelation that was upon Peter, the last days at least had been uh, begun then, I certainly believe they must be continuing. We're living in the last days. And we read Paul's writing in 1 Timothy uh, chapter 3. He says, in the last days, perilous times will come. And men will be lovers of self and lovers of pleasure, more than lovers of God. And he describes certain aspects of the fallenness of man. that will be that way in the last days. Well, we're living in the last days. Hebrews 1 says, God has spoken in these last days by his Son. So you see, here's what I, I think that makes, the Scripture makes clear. That at least from the time of the outpouring of the Spirit, and maybe even the advent of Christ, the first coming of Christ, that, that kicked into gear what we call the last days. Now in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus described what we could call the climate of the times, what the, what the times would be like in these last days. In that what's called the Olivet Discourse, Jesus was asked about the destruction of the temple and the end of the age and when will these things be? And he began to describe what will be like before the end of the age. And he talked about seven marks of the last days, seven indicators, seven things will be very prominent in the world in these last days. Let me give you five of them. You might say, why are you only giving us five when there's seven? Well, the, the last two are going to be the subject of another message, so it's like a commercial. You've got to tune in later. But here's the first five. Jesus said the last days. That you can download our study guide. Many references are there for you to study this out on your own. But in Matthew 24, verses 4, 5, 11, 23 through 25, he said the last days will be characterized by deception. There'll be people saying, I'm Christ, I'm Christ. There'll be false prophets and, and, and deception will be spreading. And, 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 and there will be a climate of spiritual deception in 1 Timothy chapter 4. Paul even said, the Spirit speaks expressingly that in the last days, many will depart from this faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. 
There's going to be a lot of deception in the last days. 2 Timothy 3, we already quoted that that's about the last days. But in verses 13 through 15, he says, In these last days, uh, there will be many people who are deceiving and enticing and drawing people away. And they'll only get worse and worse in these last days. 2 John 7 there already are many deceivers and antichrists in the world. 2 Peter 2 talks about false prophets, false teachers. They even deny the Lord. And they're using covetousness and deceptive words to bring people away from Jesus. A lot of deception in the last days. That's why you need to be in a good Bible-believing church. That's why we must be led not by what is popular, but what is in this book. So that we're grounded in the truth. So that we're not deceived in the last days. 2 Corinthians 11 even talks about Satan's messengers being disguised as, as messengers of light. Jesus, secondly, talked about wars and rumors of wars. Verses 6 through 8 of Matthew 24. He talked about famine and pestilence. Matthew 24, 7. He talked about earthquakes. Oh, we're, we're doing this from Southern California. I don't need to tell you anything about that one. But Jesus said the last days will be characterized by earthquakes all over. There's going to be a lot of earthquakes in the last days. And then, fifthly, he says there's going to be a lot of persecution. There's going to be a lot of persecution. In verse 9, he says, They will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. A man's enemies will be those of his own house, we read in the Gospel of Matthew. And, and John's Gospel records the day will come when, because they, they treated the Master this way, they're going to treat his servants this way. Uh, there's going to be a time when they deliver you into the synagogues and they throw you into the prisons and, and they think they're serving God when they do that. It'll be a time of, of persecution upon the earth. Do you realize that right now today, there, there have been in the last couple decades, more believers martyred, martyred for their faith in Jesus than all the many, many years of church history before this last, last epoch of time. We're living in these days where we're seeing famines and pestilences in different places and earthquakes and wars and rumors of wars. And, oh, is there deception in the world? But there's also persecution. And you might be living in a country where persecution is minimal, but all throughout the world, your brothers and sisters in Jesus are being persecuted. I've taught students that went out and preached and were martyred for preaching the gospel. I've taught classes where members of that class went into areas where the gospel is being lashed out against, and, and it's a violent lashing out. And one young man was shot in his car and then beheaded, and, and his body was left there on the street this is going on today. Are we living in the last days? Yes, we've been in the last days ever since the church has been born. And so there, there are these last days, persecution. Revelation 6 talks about martyrs crying out to God. And they're told, wait a while until some more of your brethren join you. Until, until more happens. Persecution in the last days. And I believe Jesus saw, he knew what, what Daniel prophesied. He quoted Daniel. And Jesus knew about Antiochus Epiphanes and what happened in that epoch of time. But yet he went on to say, it's going to be like that again. See, it's fluid. Every generation needs to go to the book of Revelation and find strength and help. Well, what is tribulation? What, what does that mean anyway? Well, the word tribulation itself is the Greek word thalipsis. Thalipsis. And thalipsis simply means pressure, threshing, affliction. It means trouble. It means when there's pressure put upon you, and that pressure has a threshing effect. As a matter of fact, listen to how John introduces himself at the beginning of this book of Revelation. He says in Revelation 1.9, I, John, both your brother and companion, in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was on the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. That's how he introduces himself. See, he was banished to Patmos for his faith in Jesus and because he wouldn't stop preaching the word and because of the testimony of Jesus Christ. He was being persecuted. But notice what he says. I am two things, your brother... We're born of the same Father. God is our Father through the new birth, through the Spirit of God giving us new life. I am your brother, but notice, and your fellow partaker, your companion in three things. Tribulation 
and the kingdom and the endurance, the patience of Jesus Christ. What is tribulation? Thalipsis, it's a pressure, it's a threshing, it's affliction. Matter of fact, Paul spoke of it. And, and to Christians in Romans 12, 12, he said, be patient. Be patient in tribulation. All of these scriptures I'm giving you use the same word, thalipsis. And then in Romans chapter 5, verse 3, he said, we are to glory in tribulation because it produces perseverance and perseverance character and character hope. Oh, I, I trust you'll remember that right now when we're going through what we're going through. I believe what we're going through right now is a time of threshing. It's a time of trial. But glory in it. Be patient in it. Let it do its perfect work. Let it develop character in you and thus hope. Romans chapter 8 verse 35 mentions Thalipsis, tribulation. And he says, I'm persuaded not even tribulation can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. 2 Corinthians 1, 4 says we are comforted by God in all of our tribulation. 2 Corinthians 7, 4 says we are to be joyful in tribulation. Thalipsis. Acts 14, 22. Oh, this is an important verse to this study. Paul went back to the churches that he had established and he was encouraging them and exhorting them that it is through much tribulation that we're pressed into the kingdom of God. Do you see there's a relationship there? Kingdom and tribulation, kingdom and tribulation. I'm your companion in kingdom and tribulation. We're through much tribulation pressed into the kingdom of God. Of God. We need to have a proper biblical understanding of this whole concept of tribulation, pressure, threshing. What happens when something is threshed? The grain is separated from the chaff. In other words, it ends up being a good process. Maybe not pleasant, but a good process. John 16, 21 and 23 uses the word ellipsis. In 21, it's compared to a, a woman, her anguish in childbearing. But it soon turns to joy when the child is born. But in John 16, Jesus said, listen to these words now. Jesus said this, these things I've spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. See, whether or not you believe in a literal seven-year period called the Great Tribulation, there's going to be tribulation in your life. There's going to be threshings and pressure and afflictions that come. Can we find victory in these times? It is a very false, dangerous, misleading teaching that tells you simply because you're a child of God, you'll never go through anything hard. That's a lie. You'll never mature if you don't go any, through anything hard. That's why we are to count it all joy when you fall into different kinds of trials. That's why through many, uh, much tribulation, threshing, we are pressed into the kingdom of God. Think about when you grew the most, when you grew more mature and closer to Jesus. Oftentimes it's around a, a time of pressure and suffering and threshing. Don't let this period that we're in now go by without letting God do what he wants to do in you. I know that's what I'm praying for the church of Jesus Christ. I'm not just praying, oh God, get us out of this, get us out of this. I'm praying, God, do your work in us through this. Don't let us miss what you're trying to do in us, Lord. This is a time of threshing, of separating the chaff from the wheat, the grain from the chaff. This is a time that we could say of tribulation. No, maybe not what others think of as the great tribulation, but it is tribulation. And tribulations will always be present. And here's why. It has to do with the tension of the ages. The tension of the two ages. You see, the Bible speaks of two ages. It speaks of this present age. It uses that phrase, this present age. And that is characterized as dominated by evil. Galatians 1.4, Jesus died to deliver us not only from our sins, but from this present evil age. And we read about this evil age, 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, the God of this age has blinded the minds of those who do not believe. And there's the wisdom of this age. And, and so Jesus talked about this age. But we also read in the scripture about the age to come. And the age to come we could call the kingdom age. Read Hebrews chapter 6, 5. We believers are participating now, somehow partaking now of the powers of the age to come. And Ephesians 1, 21, God's going to demonstrate His marvelous wisdom through the church in the age to come. 
And Paul talks about the age to come in Ephesians 2, 7, and, and also in 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 19, about the age to come. And so we have this present evil age, but there's another age coming that we could call the kingdom age. But here's where the tension comes in. Because Jesus has come, the kingdom of God has broken into this present age. Many theologians call this the doctrine of the now and the not yet, that the kingdom of God is here now and yet not yet. That future age is still future, but somehow in the person of Jesus, the kingdom has broken in upon us and the kingdom is present among those who believe. Didn't Jesus say in, in, in the gospel of Luke 17, 21, he said, lo, the kingdom of God is in your midst. What was the message of Jesus? Repent, for the kingdom of God is knocking at the door. Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. And he sent his disciples out to heal and to do miracles and to announce the presence of the kingdom of God. See, the age to come has broken in upon this age, and so there's tension. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 28, Jesus said, If I, by the Spirit of God, cast out demons, then surely the kingdom of God has come. Well, did Jesus cast out demons by the Spirit of God? Yes. So the kingdom of God has come. And that's why John could say, I'm your companion in the kingdom and in the tribulation. In other words, I'm participating in the kingdom, and yet I find myself in tribulation. And we are pressed further into the kingdom, Acts 14.22, through much Tribulation, And so there's this tension between the ages. There will always be tribulation with periods of intensification. I want you to remember that. There will always be tribulation with periods of intensification. 1 Thessalonians 3, 4. We told you before that we should suffer tribulation just as it has happened and you know. But here's what I want you to remember. When that time of intensification comes, what should you do? Jesus told us what to do. In Luke 21, 28, he said, Now when these things begin to happen, look up, lift up your heads, because your redemption draws nigh. You see, when these times of intensification, of, of a greater threshing, of, of more evil happening in the world, we should look up and rejoice and say, Maybe this is it. Maybe this is the time. Maybe this is the day. Have you felt that way lately? Don't get the events of the world drag you down. Realize that our God is in control and this present evil age will not last forever, but the kingdom will come. But if you are a believer in Jesus, you can partake of the kingdom now. You can partake of things like kingdom peace and righteousness and joy, all ministered to you by the Holy Spirit of God. There will always be tribulation, but there will always be greater triumph. There will always be tribulation, but there will also always be greater triumph because it's the triumph of the Lamb, Jesus Christ. The book of Revelation, as I stated earlier, is all about the triumph of the Lamb. And what did Jesus say? He said, in the world, John 16, in the world you will have tribulation, philipsis. There's our word, philipsis. In the world, you're going to have that. But be of good cheer. I've made a way for you to have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer. Why? I have overcome the world. Great tribulation, but greater triumph. Christ has already overcome. Jesus has already overcome. There's a glorious vision in Revelation chapter 5. All of heaven is weeping. Because no one is found worthy to open the scroll. And it seems like there's no hope for earth and humanity to be redeemed back to God. And, 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 and all, is, all are weeping. And, and then he hears a voice. Weep not. Stop your weeping. Because the lion of the tribe of Judah has prevailed. He's worthy to open the book. And John turned to see this lion, and what did he see? He saw a lamb that was freshly slain, standing. Oh, the symbolism in that. Jesus slain is the crucifixion, but he's standing. A slain lamb would be lying down, but this lamb is standing. Why? He sees the event of Jesus crucified and resurrected. And therein is our triumph. 
That Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, the Greek word for conquer or overcome, the key word for triumph that we're talking about is the Greek word nikao. And nikao means to conquer, to overcome, to prevail. And this is the word that we see in Revelation chapter 5. The lion of the tribe of Judah has prevailed. He has already conquered. Revelation 3.21, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Notice what he says to the church. He said, I've already overcome. I've already overcome and sat down with my father on his throne. I've already overcome. Last week we looked at Psalm chapter 2. Why do the heathen rage? Why do the nations rise up against God? But that psalm goes on to say, God will laugh at them. He says, I've set my king on my holy hill, Zion. And he will one day rule the nations with a rod of iron. He will dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. There's God says, all of you rising up against me, I just laugh at it. God finds that funny. It's ridiculous that they think they could ever overcome him. He's already set his king on Zion's hill. And that king is Jesus. And if you are a believer in Jesus, your king reigns. You might be going through some tribulation. You might be going through some trouble. But Jesus has already overcome. Jesus, for example, have, has already overcome the devil. He's already overcome him. He's already stripped Satan of his power. Matthew chapter 12. He was casting out demons. But he said he could do that because he had already bound the strong man. The man who ruled over this house has already been bound by Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ defeated him on the cross and disarmed demons, Colossians 1, 14 and 15. And he disarmed the power of Satan, Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. And in his death and resurrection, according to 1 Corinthians 15, he's also defeated death. According to Romans chapter 6, he's already broken the power of sin. Jesus Christ has already overcome. Oh, I, I love what one author in the book of Revelation, Daryl Johnson, said. He's talking about this struggle of the ages and, and these beasts that are trying to overthrow the things of God. And he makes this comment. See how fluid the uh, apocalyptic imagery can be? Uh, the horns, the kings do so because they reject and resist the rule of the Lamb. They do not want Jesus, who was born to rule the nations, to rule over their nation. So they go to war against him. But the Lamb wins. Why? Simply because of who he is. The Lamb will overcome them because He's Lord of Lords and King of Kings. The war ends simply by Jesus Christ showing up. He wins because although the seven heads and seven horns have great authority and strength, Jesus the Lamb has greater authority and strength. The Lamb needs no help to overcome. Oh, what victorious words He wrote. The Lamb needs no help to overcome. He wins just by showing up. When Jesus was in His earthly ministry... What was the reaction of demons when Jesus showed up? What have you to do with us? Have you come to torment us before the time? Oh, the demons always reacted because they knew Jesus had already beat them. Jesus wins by showing up. And one day at the very end of the age, when everything is at its climax, he'll show up. In power and in glory. And all of evil will be crushed forever. But right now, until that time, we need to learn the truth of how to partake of the Lamb's victory. Jesus Christ will come again. We, we affirm that. Listen to Revelation chapter 17, 14. It says, These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them. For He is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those with Him are called and chosen and faithful. Why does He win? Because He's King of kings and He's Lord of lords. This world will make war with the Lamb. It is already. It's ongoing. It's fluid. But Jesus wins. Because of who he is. He's already conquered. He's already the victorious Lamb of God. Let me read you a quote. I want you to really get this. Just as there will always be tribulation in this world with times of intensification, so shall there always be great tribulation. But there will always be great triumph in Jesus. And this triumph will be even greater. As there will always be great tribulation, there will also always be greater triumph. And one day, this triumph of Christ will climax in his return, in the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Read Revelation chapter 19. When the whole world is at war with God, he shows up like a warrior on a white horse, coming again, Lord of lords, King of kings. That's our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the victorious, slain, yet standing Lamb of God. His triumph is greater 
than any tribulation. So how do we partake of Jesus' triumph? I mean, after all, how can we be of good cheer knowing that he has overcome? Whatever happens in the world, we need to be of good cheer because he's already overcome. There will be great tribulation, but there will always be greater triumph in Christ. The slain, yet standing, and soon to come again, Lamb of God. The great warrior riding on the white horse with the armies of heaven. And the Lamb will overcome them. But notice, there are people with the Lamb. There are people who are partaking of the Lamb's victory. There are people with him, Revelation 17, 14, and they are called and they are chosen and they are faithful. You see, if you're a believer, we have a union with Jesus. Oh, just praise him. Because of our union with Jesus, this is beyond our ability to comprehend, but because of our union with Jesus through faith in Christ and the Spirit of God coming into your life in the new birth, his nature becomes our nature. We partake of the divine nature, 2 Peter 1.4. We actually share in common the divine nature of God. And he's an overcomer. He's the overcomer. And so by partaking of him, we overcome. His victory is our victory. You are, you are a born of God, little children, 1 John 4, 4, and, and have overcome them. For greater is he that is in the world than he that is in you. He was talking about the spirits of Antichrist that are already in the world. And he says, but you, you've already overcome them. You're born of God. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Our victory is in our union with Jesus who always causes us to triumph in Christ. 2 Corinthians 2, 14. Revelation 15, 2 talks about those who have gotten the victory over the beast. Oh, the beast might be this ugly foe that is scary, but there are those who get the victory over him by partaking of the Lamb's victory. By our union with Christ. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Son of God, he's born of God, 1 John 5, 4. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Revelation chapter 12, verse 11 says, And they, meaning believers, followers, those that are with the Lamb, they overcome the dragon, they overcome the evil one. They overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony, and they love not their lives, even unto death. If you're sold out for Jesus, you win. If you're sold out, if you're one of the called and chosen and faithful, then no matter how much tribulation is in the world, there will always be for you greater triumph. Because it's the victory of Jesus. It's the victory of Christ. Now, in, we started our message today, and I need to close where we started, and that's back in Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 through 17. Remember that vision? He saw these people coming out with white robes, waving palm branches, worshiping the Lord. He says, who are these guys? Well, I don't know. You tell me. So, the, the, this, in this vision, John is told who these people are. These are those who've come out of great tribulation, and they've washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. In that same chapter 7, verse 3, they're the ones who are sealed by God. We studied that last week. The Holy Spirit is our seal, if you're a believer. If you're a believer, God wants you to know you can be a part of this company of overcomers who come out. Why? Because we've received the Holy Spirit and we are sealed and we are washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's no other way to be clean before God but by the blood of the Lamb. Revelation 1, 5, they are set free by the blood of the Lamb. Revelation 5, 9, we have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. 1 John 1, 7, if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of His Son, Jesus, cleanses us from all sin. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to cleanse us of our sin, cleanse us of all unrighteousness. You can be cleansed by the blood of Jesus. Right now, I know it's a supernatural thing. You'll never understand it. But if you're, if you're not clean before God right now, just pray, Lord Jesus, cleanse me. You shed your blood. And I want to be one of those whose garments are white and pure, ready for the wedding, by the blood of the Lamb. And notice these people in Revelation 7, they are experiencing the presence of God. 
They are experiencing the presence of God. Look at verse 15 of chapter 7. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve Him night and day in His temple. He who sits on the throne will shelter them with His presence. The Lamb is in the midst of the throne, will be their shepherd. They know the presence of God. That's why their lives are filled with worship. They're bursting with worship. Salvation belongs to our God. They're waving those palm branches in worship. It's a vision of a forgiven, redeemed, cleansed, victorious, worshiping people. Are you a part of that crowd? Are you redeemed? Bought by Jesus? Have you confessed Jesus as Lord and Savior and opened your heart and faith and repentance to Him and known the forgiveness of the, that which was accomplished by His blood? And are you knowing the presence of God in worship? They are those who experience on a regular basis the presence of God. They're around the throne and they're serving Him. Are you one who is serving Him? It says the lamb who's on the throne will be their shepherd. He's guiding them. He's shepherding them. And he's satisfying them. They're not going to hunger. They're not going to thirst anymore. Why? Because they know the lamb. They might be coming out of great tribulation. But they're coming out in greater triumph. Because they're one with the lamb. How about you, my friend, as we close this service? Have you become one with Jesus you say, how? How? I want to be one. Well, by faith. Just put your faith in Jesus. He died on the cross for you, but he's raised from the dead. He's alive today. He sends his spirit. You can know him by his spirit. Right now, just pray, dear Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Come into my life. I turn to you, Lord. And he will come. And you will be united with him. And his nature will be something you can grow in and partake of. His victory will become your victory. His triumph will become your triumph. You can say, I have peace because in the world I have trouble, but I'm going to be of good cheer. Jesus, whom I'm one with, he's already overcome the world. Do you know Jesus? Spending time every day in his presence, serving him. And we're not perfect, but as we walk in the light, there's a continual cleansing so that our robes are white before him. There is great tribulation. Always will be. It'll intensify at times, and it'll be real intense right before he comes. But there will always be greater triumph. Because Jesus, Lamb of God, has already conquered. Let's pray right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for the victory. And I pray that you will bring that victory into every heart listening now. As we close with a song, just open your heart to Jesus. As we sing of the holiness of God, just know that God wants to come and be that shepherd on the throne, that lamb who's also the shepherd. See, there, there's a twist in the picture there, but it's beautiful. He's the lamb, but he becomes your shepherd. And he'll lead you to waters. You can have joy and peace and satisfaction. Yes, tribulation, but greater triumph. God bless you. Pray now as this song is continuing.
We trust this service has been a blessing to you, and I'm so grateful that you would take the time to join us to worship along as we were worshiping and singing, and to open your mind and your heart to the Word of God. Go ahead and download those, those sermon notes, and you can get all kinds of Bible studies on this message that you just heard. And we want you to be a part of some upcoming things. Uh, get ready to also listen to Pastor Matthew's message this week. He's going to be speaking on Fresh and Fearless. Wow, that sounds exciting, so I hope you tune in for that. In the month of June, Pastor Matthew and I are going to be team teaching a series on Romans 6, 7, and 8. So be studying that. And if you want to do some supplemental reading along with that, we encourage you to order Watchman Nee's book, The Normal Christian Life. And we're going to be doing an in-depth study together of Romans 6, 7, and 8, uh, starting in June. So we want you to get ready for that. Uh, the Normal Christian Life was the name of the book. If we can help you or be of any prayer uh, help to you or anything else, you can email me at this address, mark at vcachurch.com. We also encourage you to come back Wednesday night, tune in again, and be a part of our live stream prayer meeting. And we're going to expect, in these troubling times, greater triumph. We're overcoming together, so let's rejoice in Jesus. God bless you.